among cattle in poverty sore, living in meekness by Galilee's shore, dying in shame as the wicked once swore. Jesus, wonderful Lord, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. preaching time, I am so delighted that Dr. Tom Lancaster is with us tonight. Brother Lancaster has been preaching since 1967 and uh, from, uh, uh, from the uh, South Carolina and then to Memphis and Memphis to Germany and then uh, the, the base closed down there and so God used him in a mighty way in, uh, in Germany. And then uh, he came back, and he's now the international director for uh, the military ministry, which we need desperately uh, for our soldiers. Amen. How many of you served in, in the armed forces? Raise your hand. And you know the need there. Amen. You know that we need good churches surrounding every base, and we need good chaplains that are not liberal but preach the Word of God. And uh, Brother Lancaster's been in a long time. And God's used him uh, to train a lot of workers and a lot of missionaries uh, for the glory of God. Uh, several came out of Germany, and we just thank God for him. And I've always uh, uh, wanted to have him preach. And uh, the other day, uh, Jason and I were uh, fishing, and uh, he and his son came up. And they started catching more fish than me. I said, I ain't going to invite him to preach. He's catching more fish than we are. And uh, we was up with Brother Eddie. Uh, Killian's Pond and I said we need to have you preach sometime and that's all you got to say to a missionary to an evangelist and he helped me do it amen and I thank God he did so I'm looking forward to hearing him preach and uh, you give, give him your undivided attention and let's go to worship amen and folks it's all about Jesus amen, amen. thank the Lord I told brother Cofield uh, where I have been in the last 15 minutes I feel like I should have stopped and gotten a hat so I could throw my hat in before I came in. 
Um, I, let, let me tell you this. I've been in 47 different churches in the last year, and that's in spite of COVID and everything. And I'm an old man. I uh, um, And I say that because I, I get mixed up sometimes. And now, I'm not going to make any further explanation if Brother Cofield will ever speak to me after tonight, getting here late like this, uh, I'll give him the full explanation. But let me just tell you this, 30 minutes ago, I was in Cleveland, Tennessee. <laughs> I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I had taken the turn at Walgreens Drugstore, and I was looking for Whitfield Baptist Church. And uh, oh my goodness. And I called my wife and I, I said, honey, I, I think I've gotten a little mixed up. And she said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm right here in Cleveland. And she said, Tommy, you're supposed to be someplace else. And so, I mean, to top everything else off, I've got to go home and face her tonight. <laughs> But um, I have been trying to do this for at least three or four years to come here. And uh, I, I love Brother Cofield. He's always a blessing and encouragement to me every time I have an opportunity to spend a few minutes with him. And uh, then uh, to, uh, we, we, uh, I am online with him, whatever that means, but... Uh, uh, I see what's going on here and uh, see the people that are getting baptized and getting saved and I thank the Lord for that. And uh, good to see Brother and Mrs. Underwood and uh, I know that what he said about the church is uh, certainly true and uh, I'm just thankful to be here tonight. I do represent uh, missions, uh, missions to the United States military I served in the United States Marine Corps and got saved while I was in the Marine Corps and uh, then got out and, and uh, went to Bible college and started churches and pastored churches and uh, 25 years ago went to Germany and stayed there for 20 years and uh, God did bless in a wonderful way and He does bless. We, we have... Uh, 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 a million and a half military people, United States military, in uniform today. Uh, 160,000 of those are stationed on foreign soil. Um, 40,000 of those are in places of great, great danger. And uh, I'm thankful that you have a love for the military. Amen. I do adhere you if you have not already found the scripture it's found in Hezekiah chapter 2 and verse 6, which says, to the military first and also to the Greek. And I do hope that you have a place for United States military in your missions outreach. And if not, I do trust that you will pray about that. I, I don't want to palaver long. I've gotten into too much trouble already. Uh, uh, take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, that really is in the Bible. Uh, but turn to Habakkuk uh, chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. Uh, I have no idea what your customs are, but my custom is to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word if you would be kind enough to do that and if you're able to do that. Once again, church, thank you so much. I know you have waited and patiently and wondered and, and uh, just thank you and please forgive this old man. Uh, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigenah. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Thank you, and you may be seated. Amen. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you, O God, for 
this church, the testimony of this church. Thank you, dear God, for the reputation among God's people concerning Brother and Mrs. Cofield. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for those that labor with them here. Thank you, dear God, for the two men that got baptized this morning. Thank you, dear Lord, for the hands of those that I saw that have served in our military. Thank you, dear God, for missionaries, Brother and Mrs. Underwood, and all the missionaries that have been supported and are supporting and been sent out from this church. God, help me now. Lord, you know, for days I've prayed about the message tonight. And Lord, I, I believe with all of my heart that I've got your message. Lord, I have no idea why I fouled up the way I did earlier tonight. Uh, but God, I just ask now that in your divine mercy and grace that you might use me. And speak to our hearts, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't believe that I would have to proof text it or historically prove it in any way, shape, form, or fashion to cause you to agree with me that we need revival. Amen. It's the only hope of our country. Right. Uh, there is no other hope. And should not, there should not be any other hope except the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I have never voted for a Democrat in my life and do not plan to ever vote for a Democrat. Uh, and the reason is, is because, well, I've got several reasons, but I do not believe that it's right to murder unborn babies. And, uh, and I have a real uh, heart-wrenching, as I know you do, sure. burden about that. And, uh, but regardless, the Democrats are not going to solve our problems. And uh, the Republicans did not solve our problems. Uh, somebody might say, did you vote for Donald Trump? Yes, I did. And if I can do it, I will do it again. Um, I do not agree with his cursing. I do not agree with his lifestyle that he has used in the past, lived in the past. But every time I think about Donald Trump, I think about the power and goodness of God. How God can use a man like that to get America closer to its founding principles than we have been in a long, long time. So let me just pass by that and say we need a revival. Amen. Now, this obviously is a wonderful church. I do not know your spiritual temperature. Your pastor could tell me. But there's the possibility that this church needs a revival. Sure. In spite of the fact that you saw precious souls baptized this morning, also your home may need reviving. Sure. Or you may need a revival. What is a revival? It's a return to the first things. Did you know the church was born in revival? And did you realize that when a child of God is born into the kingdom of God. That child of God is born with the Holy Spirit within them. Amen. And having the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, what is revival? I think it's the fullness of the Spirit. Some call it full surrender. Uh, others call it total submission. But there is something where Almighty God visits an individual or visits a family, or a church, or a nation. And things are different when God visits. God wants to revive us. Did you know that America would, probably would not have been America had it not been for revival? That's right. 
1727, there was a small chapel about 50 kilometers east of Herrenhut, Germany. And there were that, in that small chapel, there were a group of people, less than a hundred, and there was an aristocrat that was the preacher there. His name was Zinzendorf. He was an Austrian count. And Zinzendorf had a burden for his people. There was something that was taking place in Europe and a bloody, bloody, uh, a bloodbath was coming to Europe and a guillotine would be taken through the streets of Paris and people that disagreed with the revolution, they would be put on the cart and their necks would be put on the guillotine and they would be executed. But that didn't happen in Germany at that time because revival came to Germany. It went across the English Channel and it went to England. And there, revival continued with two men named Charles and John Wesley. Although you and I would disagree with some of their doctrine, we cannot deny that Almighty God used those men in a great way. They were kicked out of their pulpits but the fields could not hold the crowds that came to hear John Wesley uh, preach and Charles Wesley sing. And they also had a relationship with a man named George Whitfield. And there was a disagreement between Whitfield and the Wesleys. And they parted company. And Whitfield came to America. And revival continued in America. And a man named Jonathan Edwards up in New England. God used him in a tremendous way and revival came again. Let me just simply say this without going further. America has survived because of revival. America needs a revival today. Uh, You say, Brother Lancaster, have you ever seen a nationwide revival? No, I hope to. Um, I stopped, Dottie and I stopped in Indiana, Indiana years ago, and we went into a restaurant off of the interstate. And uh, while uh, uh, I was uh, ordering, I looked around, and I saw some uh, photographs on the wall that had been blown up, and, uh, and they were all, they were the same theme. It was pictures of tents with a massive crowd going into those tents. I got up and looked at it. And that community there at one time had had an old-fashioned tent meeting where thousands of people came from the farms and from the nearby towns and heard a man named Billy Sunday preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And revival came to that community. Yes, America needs a revival. Our churches need revival. I was so thrilled to see what I saw about your church here this morning. I want to tell you something. Sad to say, a lot of our churches that used to win people to Christ, I'm not seeing them win people to Christ like they used to win people to Christ. And of course, other things that I do not know of, but I am sure there's the possibility that Satan could get in in some way. But regardless, families need revival. Let me just ask you this. Is your family as close to God as it used to be? Is your family as much in love with the Lord as it used to be? Now, as I say, we may never experience another nationwide revival or even a community revival or a church revival. I hope you will. Pray you will. But every one of us can leave here tonight with a revival from Almighty God. If we need one, we can leave here with a renewed desire to serve God, going higher for the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the formula is found in the Word of God. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 
Your pastor has preached on it. You've heard preaching on it. You've heard lessons on it. God's Word says, if my people, that's where the problem of America lies. The problem of America does not lie at the foot of the porn pusher or the uh, liquor dealer or the crooked politician or even the liberal preacher. The problem in America lies at the feet of God's people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Did you know that the Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but He gives grace to the humble? I got three pointed back at me and I have to ask myself this question regularly. Tommy, do you have a problem with pride? Tommy, are you truly a humble person? I ask myself questions like this. Can I take advice easily? Or do I bow my neck up when I get advice? Do I listen to others? Do I listen to my wife? Uh, do I listen to my friends? Do I listen to my pastor? I had a member of my church in South Carolina. He, he was older than I was. He's in heaven now. A wonderful, wonderful man. But he and I had different personalities and, and we, we just, we did, we didn't G-haw sometimes. You understand what I mean by G-haw? Uh, we, we didn't G-haw sometimes. But we still loved each other and cared for each other. And, and, uh, but he would always talk about another preacher. But I knew he was talking about me. And one day the conversation went something like this. A brother so-and-so, uh, 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 Brother Lancaster, do you know Pastor so-and-so right down the road here at Chitlin Switch? Uh, he, he's the most humble man I know. Boy, I'll tell you what. Everybody loves him. Now that told me something right there. So everybody loves him. He is a humble man. And I was just a little bit tired of it. And so I replied by saying, my dear brother, I know that preacher. He's not humble. He's just got bad posture. He said, what do you mean? I said, you ever see the way he walks around? That's why you think he's humble, just because he doesn't stand up straight. Uh, uh, no, uh, humility is not posture. Humility is not in a lot. Here's what I believe humility is. It is strict, loving obedience to Almighty God. Amen. Doing what God tells us to do. The Bible makes it undeniably clear that sin is rebellion. It's rebellion against God. It's saying no to God. I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And... Um, so the Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. We've, we've got to pray. Not our lay me down to sleep prayers. Not our dear God bless my food prayers. But seasons of prayer. If our country ever needed prayer, it needs prayer now. Can you imagine, and I'm, I know it's in the hands of God, but can you imagine what's going to happen if this upcoming Georgia election goes in the wrong direction? We need to pray. We need to fast and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now what does it mean to seek God's face? Mark, our son Mark has been here before. You, you know our son Mark. Uh, he's about 260 something pounds and he's six foot four, but I can remember when he was just a chubby little fellow. And um, I'd say, son, uh, pick that up off the floor and he'd squeeze. 
And I'd say, son, listen to me. Listen to me, boy. Listen to me. And you know what I would do? I would do what some of you have done with your children. I would go over and take his face. And I would point it straight at me. Listen to me, boy. I'm talking to you. It meant to pay attention. That's what that phrase means. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, pay attention to God. Now this is what we need to pay attention to. The Word of God. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I've often said, and it probably isn't true here, but I've often said that the average Baptist believes that there's only about a half a dozen real sins. You know, I don't get drunk. I don't take dope. I don't take God's name in vain. I run around on my mate. And uh, that's about it. But did you know that the Bible does say more about that? And God's Word does say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. A woman came to the altar in a meeting that Curtis Hudson was holding in uh, Dallas. And Curtis Hudson spoke to her. And he asked her, Lady, do you know the Lord is your Savior? And she said, Yes, I do. Well, why did you come to the altar? I came because I believe I need to get some sin right with God. Curtis Hudson said, pray and ask God to forgive you. Tell Him what it is. And she said, I'm not sure what my sin is. Curtis Hudson replied by saying, yes, you'll probably hit it on the first guess. Did you know something? We do, we do know when, when we're not right. There's a preacher inside of us Amen. that's telling us, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I love it, I, I don't want to scare you and I won't do it like I normally do, then, then, whoo, God says, then, then, then I will hear from heaven and heal their sin and, and, and forgive their sin and heal their land. What a wonderful truth from God. Amen. But you know, there, there, is a, there is a personal individual uh, example of revival. It's found in Psalm 51. And of course, that's David's pinnacle prayer. That's David praying. Now forget about Forget about what David did other than this. He had sinned. That's all you need to know. He had sinned. That's all that you need to know. We need not compare our sin with somebody else's sin. All we need to know is that David sinned and he had to come to God. Look, if you will, at verse 1. Have mercy on me. When is the last time you have felt the need to pray for mercy. It's a wonderful thing, mercy is. Amen. When is the last time you have found a need to pray for mercy? Have mercy upon me, O God. Look, if you will, please, at verse 2. Wash me through, Lear, or thoroughly. Have you experienced? Now, I know that I'm preaching to good people. Sunday night, go to church people. But that doesn't mean that you and I don't need to get some things right with the Lord. Amen. Have you ever had a thorough washing? A thorough washing. Had a lady in my church in Memphis, wonderful lady, wife of a deacon, Sunday school teacher, wonderful, wonderful lady. And one Sunday morning, she came to the altar 
And I mean, it was, it was something. The wailing, the crying, the hysteria. And I knelt down in front of her. We had an altar rail. And I knelt down in front of her and I called her name and I said, is there anything I can do? Oh, oh, preacher, no. I need to talk to God about this. Oh, I never dreamed that it would come to this. And I went back to the pulpit and we continued to sing and she was there wailing and and uh, finally I dismissed the service and she moved to the front pew and sat down and continued to weep. And I asked myself the question, what has this wonderful girl done? Has she cheated on her husband? Has some way or another, has she gotten involved with drugs? What has this beautiful Christian young lady done? And I sat down beside her and I said, called her name again. And I said, now look, you don't have to tell me. Oh, preacher, I want to. I've got to be accountable to somebody. I know I'm going to be accountable to God, but I've got to have somebody that I can be accountable to. And she said, preacher, I never dreamed that I would get this far away from God. And then she finally blurted out her sin that had brought her to such wailing. Preacher, I haven't read my Bible in five days. That was it. May I tell you that I've met people in my life that don't get concerned until they find out that their son's in jail or their daughter's pregnant, not married. Or their wife just told them that they're going to leave them. But wouldn't it be refreshing if at the end of every day we got everything right with God? Wash me thoroughly. Or wash me thoroughly. Look further, if you will. In verse 3, he said, I acknowledge my transgression. I acknowledge it. My sin is ever before me. And look at verse 4. Oh, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Look at verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. The psalmist, once again, he said, Search me, O God. Search me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And I want to close by letting you see four spirits. Four spirits. But before I do, look at verse 10, creating me a clean heart. You remember when you got your heart cleaned up? I thank God I've never gone back to the hog pen that God saved me out of. Now, that doesn't mean that I have always been right with God and that I have not had my heart broken. I can remember too vividly a time in my life where it seemed as though everything had dried up. Now, I was doing everything that I was supposed to do including going to the pulpit, including teaching my class, including reading my Bible, maybe with not the joy that I had before. But one night in a hotel room, I knelt down to pray. And I had some particular things on my heart. And God said, Son, are you ready to do business with me? He didn't say that here. He said it here. And I said, Yes, Lord. And God put His finger on something in my heart. And I confessed it. And the tears began to flow. And what he did was he peeled that one back 
and did away with it. And he showed me the next one and a couple of others. God desires truth in the inward parts. Look, if you will, please, at the next part of that verse. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. Now you might say, Spirit? That's talking about the Holy Spirit. No, that's the next verse. This spirit, as a matter of fact, there are four spirits. And when we get to the fourth, we'll be just about finished. But this spirit is spirit attitude. How's your attitude? I have no fear in telling you that if you've got a bad attitude, you're not part of any kind of solution. You're part of a problem. I had a wonderful situation this past Sunday. I was just outside of Millington Naval Air Base, outside of Memphis. And a retired Marine Sergeant Major Tough guy. But he had gotten saved. And I began to preach about attitudes. And that dear, dear man hit the altar, weeping and wailing and asking God to forgive him of his bad attitude. You got a good attitude? It takes a good attitude to be a part of the solution. You must have a right spirit or a right attitude in order to have revival from Almighty God. Did you know something? If you got the courage to do it, you can ask your husband, Honey, what do you think about my attitude? He's been dying to tell you. <laughs> or ask her, Sweetheart, How's my attitude? She's been wanting to tell you. Or here's one better. Just ask your kids. I never will forget. I knocked on a door in South Carolina and uh, I had uh, uh, preached and said some things about rock music. And uh, uh, the kids went back home and told mom and daddy, you know, they were excited about it. And, uh, and so the dad got mad because he was a rock music fanatic. And I, they wouldn't let him come to church the next week, and I went by and visited him. And, uh, and so the husband, he just sort of straightened and rough all of his feathers out. And, well, Reverend, we've got a good family, and, and, uh, and uh, everything's okay here. We don't think we need your church. And that little old boy, I mean to tell you, shh, out of the mouth of babes. He said, but mama, daddy, y'all do cuss at each other a lot. <laughs> you know, kids will tell you. Ask them how your attitude is. They know. They'll tell you. Look, if you will, please, at verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Right spirit? Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes within us never to leave us. Now the Bible does say, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled, be controlled by the Spirit of Almighty God. Amen. Boy, you talk about a dumb preacher. I, I was one, still am a little bit, but I was really dumb. And I had so much baggage. In November of 1962, I was in jail for the last time. I was there for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct and assault and battery and resisting arrest. I've never been in jail for, you know, what you would call, well, you know, murdering somebody or stealing something or anything. It all revolved around drinking and fighting. 
And uh, But I've never been back to the hog pen that God saved me out of. And I thank the Lord for His goodness. Uh, the psalmist said here, he said, Take not thy Holy Spirit. But in my church in South Carolina, my first church, there were two guys that came forward and surrendered to preach within a week of each other. And, you know, I was in my first year of Bible college. And uh, I said to myself, they need to hear about the Holy Spirit and I need to study on it some more because I need it. So everybody else can go to sleep but I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit. And these two guys, maybe they'll get it. Maybe I'll get it. And so I preached on the Holy Spirit. Never will forget that day. When I gave the invitation, the altar in that church was filled. Down on this end was an old thick-hand, leather-faced farmer named Bernice Yarbrough. And I put my hands on Mr. Yarbrough's shoulders and I said, Mr. Yarbrough, why did you come to the altar, my brother? He looked up at me and you could see tears going down the wrinkles like water going down a stream. And he said indignantly to this dumb preacher, he said, preacher, farmers need to be filled with the Spirit too, don't they? I said, yeah. I went to the next one, the next one, and the next one, and down at the end of the altar was my wife. She had left the uh, the organ and she had come to the altar. I said, Dottie, why'd you come, honey? She said, Tommy, our children need a spirit-filled mother And you need a spirit-filled wife. Pray for me that I'll be filled with the Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit? Now you might say, preacher, I just can't say. And you're right. Because if we get to bragging about being filled with the Spirit, we won't be filled with the Spirit. But let me tell you what I have learned. You may not always be conscious of the fact that you are filled with the Spirit, but you will dead sure know it when you're not filled with the Spirit. He said, take not thy Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Right spirit, Holy Spirit, and free spirit. This is Georgia. I remember years ago I was preaching in Kentucky. Oh, I mean to tell you, it was it was a happening. The preacher got up and he said, I want the uh, kids' choir to come to the altar. Everybody 18 years old and below came to, I, mean, I said, not altar, to the choir. Everybody 18 years old and below came to the choir. They sung for about 15 or 20 minutes and he said, all right, now I'd like our adult choir to come. Everybody that did not come on the first call came on the second. And uh, while we were singing congregational song, there were two ladies sitting on the front. And I mean, they were dressed exquisitely, exquisitely, modestly, beautifully. And they had their hankies, you know, and, and woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, uh, and, and I mean the singing was wonderful. And about that, Dot and I were sitting right behind them. But about that time, one of them took off. And she began to lap the building, just running around. Running. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah! Woo! And on about the third trip, her friend got it. And she took off that way. And they were just lapping each other like that. Now, somebody would say, oh, I tell you what, they had the freedom of the Spirit. That's not the freedom of the Spirit. Could be excitement. Could be real worship if it's done 
in the authority and power of Almighty God. But you know what the freedom of the Spirit is? The freedom of the Spirit is doing what you know you ought to do because you love God and not because somebody has banged you over the head with the Bible. Amen. Let me just meddle. You'll be back on Wednesday night if you've got a right spirit. That's right. Free spirit. You'll be back Wednesday night. You'll read your Bible. You say, oh, I know what the preacher's got us on a reading plan. No, no, not because he's got you on a reading plan. It's just because you love the Lord. Because you, I, I tell you another thing you'll do. You'll tell people about how you got saved. Because that's why God left you here. He didn't leave you here to decorate the place. He left you here to glorify Him through reaching other people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Telling other people about the Lord. Now, I, I want you to look at verse 12 again. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, <laughs> then, <laughs> woo! Then, Will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee? Amen. I was preaching a meeting in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I'd been there several times before at that church. Pastor, good friend. We started services on Sunday morning. When I gave the invitation on Sunday morning, the altar was filled. He began to deal with people on this side. I began to deal with them on this side. It eventually led me to a couple. And when I got to that couple, I said to the man, Sir, let me ask you this. Do you know the Lord is your Savior? He said, Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I said, What about you, ma'am? She said, Yes, I know the Lord is my Savior. He said, Brother Lancaster, he said, God's been speaking to us now for weeks. And we're getting some things right with God. We needed to do it. And Brother Lancaster, we've got family here in Fort Smith that are lost. Would you pray for them? And I said, yes, I will. I went back to the platform and the preacher dismissed the service. We began to fellowship. They caught me in the middle of the aisle and they said, now don't forget to pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for my wife and I. Pray for my brother, my sister-in-law, my nephew and my niece. Pray for him. Pray for him, please, Brother Lancaster. I said, I will. And I prayed for him right there. The next day, the preacher and his family and I ate at their house. She had a beautiful table set. And, and after everything had been placed on the table, the man stood up and he said to the pastor, Pastor, we've got something that we've got to do. We'll be back in about an hour, but y'all go ahead and eat. Ain't never had that happen to me before. <laughs> so he had prayer and they left. If you get to know me, you'll know that I'm very, very nosy. And I found out. I found out after all of the wonderful things happened. But while we were eating, they were upstairs in the bedroom, weeping and crying and asking God to continue to deal with them. Next day, the preacher and I went out visiting. And uh, we visited a beautiful home. He rung the doorbell, and he'd already told me, he said, these folks are not members of our church, but they've got family in our church. And uh, he said, um, you just go ahead and talk to them as you would like to. And so we went in, and, and uh, she came to the door. Hey, preacher, how are you doing? This is the man that we have preaching this week, Brother Lancaster. And she said, come on in. And the, George, uh, Brother Taylor is here. Uh, come on out. And so George came out. And I shook George's hand. He big old guy. And I twisted his arm, jokingly. And I said, we're out twisting arms. See if we can get people to come to church. He said, we'll be there tonight. I said, God bless you. And I began to talk to him about the Lord and he got a little bit feisty about it. And I said, I'll leave him alone because he's coming tonight. But we came to church that night 
and they weren't there. They didn't come. But that couple, <laughs> pray for us, Brother Lancaster. Pray for my brother and sister-in-law. Please pray for my nephew and my niece. I did. Prayed for them. Next day, the preacher and I went out visiting again. Among other visits, we went to a shabby part of town. There was a door that was screen door. The screen was hanging off and there was litter out in the front. The preacher told me, he said, this is a young girl. That's all he said. Preacher, you talk to her. I said, okay. And she came to the door and she was holding a baby, an infant baby. And he introduced me to her and I walked in. We walked in. We began to talk. And I began to give her the gospel. But two of her girlfriends came in and messed the whole thing up. But she said, I'll be there tonight. We went to church that night, and lo and behold, there the girl was, sitting three rows back, and had the baby in her arms. She didn't take the baby to the nursery. When I gave the invitation, I said, let's everybody bow your heads and close your eyes, and if you need to be saved, I want you to raise your hand. And her hand went up among some others. But when we began to sing, she didn't come. After the But let me tell you this. You remember that couple? Pew, there they are again. Preacher, pray for us. God's dealing with us. And please pray for our family. We want to get thoroughly right with God. God wants to save our family. I know that. But pray for us. Pray for our family. I told the preacher, I said, Preacher, you know that girl we visited? I said, she was there tonight. He said, yes, I saw her. I spoke to her. I said, she raised her hand, but she didn't come forward. He said, Preacher, let me tell you about that girl. He said, uh, she got pregnant, and her daddy kicked her out of the house. Her daddy's never laid eyes on her since he kicked her out of the house and she was pregnant. He's never seen the, his grandbaby. He refuses to let his wife see her. That's why that girl is just living alone. The boy abandoned her. He said, Preacher, he said, um, rumor is, and he shouldn't have told me a rumor, but he did. He said, rumor is, is that George has been running around on his wife. Old big George. And the boy just got out of jail for doing drugs. I said, preacher, let's make that our first visit in the morning. I preached again that night and there they were. Preacher, pray for us. Pray for us. I um, went back the next night and there was on the back row George. I'm here, but bless me if you can. And right beside him is a little wife who's emotionally been beaten down. And on the end of the Pew is an old boy that had the look of the devil on his face. But there was also in that room a brother and a sister-in-law who had been getting thoroughly right with God. When I gave the invitation, would you venture a guess which one came first? That old teenage boy came out of there and you could hear him bawling all the way to the altar. I need to get saved. I need to get saved, preacher. I need to get saved. He came to the altar and Brother Taylor knelt down with him and began to show him the Scripture. 
about that time, his mother left where she was. And she came and knelt down beside her son. Preacher, I need to get saved too. I saw it all. I mean, I had a perfect view of all of it. Third row back, here comes the girl. She hands the baby to the lady in front of her, comes to the altar and pushes her mother aside and her brother aside. Preacher, I need to get saved too. Brother Taylor led them all to the Lord. I saw it. Didn't hear it, but I saw it. I saw that girl get up from being led to the Lord and go back to her daddy. He held on. Uh uh. Uh uh. Uh uh. She left him. She came and got her baby from the lady that she had left the baby with. She went back to that father while we were singing the invitation song, stood in front of him for just a second, and then handed him the baby. He looked down at that baby, and he began to shake like a bowl of jelly. He came to the altar, baby at all, baby and all, and handed the baby eventually to, to his daughter and knelt down and said, I need to get saved too. Let me read it again. Verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted. Who is it that you know of that needs to be saved? Is it a granddaddy? Is it a grandmother? Is it a husband, wife? Is it a kid? A neighbor? The psalmist said, I'm going to get right. Then I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. And then sinners are going to be converted. Do you personally need a revival? Do you personally need a revival? I believe that if you're saved, the Holy Spirit in you will communicate what I just asked. Do you personally need a revival? Father, will you help us now? God, please help us. I'll ask our Musicians, not to begin to play yet, please. Father, help us, O oh God. Thank you again for the kindness of these sweet people. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, now I'm asking you a question that's got some implications to it. I'm going to ask you, do you need a revival? That means that you're not as close to God as you used to be. That means that the Holy Spirit has identified maybe some attitude, maybe some deed, Maybe, maybe something like that. But He has identified something in your life. Something. Let me just ask you not to play for just a moment. Just a second, please. Thank you. Now, how many in this room say, Brother Lancaster, I need a revival. I know what it implies. I need a revival. Slip up your hand if that's it. Preacher, I need a personal revival. I need a revival. I need a revival. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Numbers of people here. Let's just cut to the chase, if you will, please. Without any music playing right now, will you get up and head to this altar and do what needs to be done at an altar? Just get up and head this way right now. Preacher, I need a revival.
What were you playing, dear lady? Pass me not. Will you play pass me not? Thank you. Others? Anybody else? Thou desirest truth in the inward part. Truth in the inward parts. Anybody else? Anybody in this room tonight, you say, Brother Lancaster, if I were to drop dead right this minute, I'm not sure that I'm saved. Will you pray for me? Slip up your hand if that's it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let's stand to our feet, if you will, please. Those of you that are still out there, and let's sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior.